Hi, I'm Tequila Mockingbird, and you are watching Tequila TV. This is Tequila TV episode number 14, and it's the second part of our story about Martin Atkins. Martin is writing a book about his experiences playing drums for the band Public Image Limited, a.k.a. PIL. He was in the band from 1979 to 1985. And the book is about his observations, personal trials, and struggles during his time with the band. But don't forget the good times. The book is called Memories, My Time In and Out of Public Image Limited. Enjoy. You are watching Tequila TV. As I look back on this stuff now, it's like, well, clearly, this is going down the fucking toilet. Next show, Detroit. Five point one. It's fucking five point one shit going on. Hey. Strap yourselves in, because it's going to be fucking crazy. We, we did a show at, at Gildersleeves, which was across the street from CBGB's the night after the Palladium in New York. And as crazy as the Palladium was, Gildersleeves was fucking crazy. The audience was there. 400 people, and it was so pill. It was like, yeah, we could have played CBGBs. We're playing like next door to CBGBs at the biker bar, motherfuckers. Way more dangerous, right? Not predictable. And that was like, fuck, we can do anything. This could be insane. And along the same lines, I think somebody said, in Detroit, we should play like a skating rink. <laughs> Would have been great if anybody knew where it was. Right? So whereas we played to three and a half thousand people in New York, um, we played to, I think, 240 people in Detroit. Um, I don't know who sent me these photographs. Once again, children. <laughs> Fucking children. Whoa! Hello! Watch out for my ankles. Fucking stripper fuel. Crazy right foot! Here we go! Ah! I'm not being pulled by anything! <laughs> Children. Indeed! Whoa! Keith Levine on roller skates. Why? You get the heroin faster. <laughs> so, this is where it gets really shit. So what are we now? Five shows in, seven shows total. Um, <clears throat> we uh, we go and play in Chicago. Um, Keith was not well. I think Keith would be the first person to tell you uh, he was addicted to heroin for a couple of years of this story. Um, <clears throat> and there were some times where I didn't know what was going on. Like, uh, how old was I? 20? <clears throat> I hadn't been around this stuff. I thought it was weird that somebody was eating a lot of custard, you know? Retrospective, you go, well, a fucking course, whatever, right? But, <clears throat> um, so we get to Chicago and Keith is not well enough to leave Chicago. And we're gonna fly to LA. Um, and I, some negotiations took place. Um, there's one school of thought um, to go back to New York, for Keith to go back to New York um, to get well, to then join us in LA. There's also that school of wisdom says we all fucking stay together. We're on a Pan Am flight from Chicago 
to Los Angeles. And Keith, within an hour, is strapped across three seats uh, in like palpitations. Uh, I thought he was gonna die. I'm sure we had three days in LA before our first activity and Keith gets well. We get to LA and we find out the real purpose of the extra hotel room on our itineraries. Um, there was a listening room on every rooming list. Okay. We all had our own suites, right? We didn't need a, a listening room. And there was a boom box on the table. Okay. When we get to LA, we realize what the purpose of that boom box was. Um, she had an appearance on uh, uh, American Bandstand, Saturday the 3rd of um, May, 1980. I asked John Brian King to come tonight. He lives in Sacramento now. But um, he said I could use his photographs. He's got the most amazing photographs from American Bandstand. What is Keith doing behind the drums? He does not belong behind a drum kit. Some great shots. So, the, the, listening, the purpose of the listening room was that pop tones and careering were like eight minutes long. And I don't think anybody thought to ask ABC if we could have like a 20 minute slot on American Bandstand. So the songs were cut down to fit with their time format. So the idea of the listening room, it turns out, was for John mainly to learn the new versions of the songs so we could mime and not look like a bunch of assholes. Yeah, um, it went off the rails pretty quickly. But John just didn't know where the words were going to come, so uh, he just ran off. Got kind of really coolly, you know. And um, God bless ABC. I'd love to see footage from the concert. Camera two, zoom in on the running singer going up the stairs. Came back to me, back to me. <laughs> like look at this guy, it was like fantastically captured by a super professional crew. He's like, oh, he's picking his nose, he's sticking a Vicks inhaler, zoom in on the Vicks inhaler. Yeah, it was fucking bonkers. And Dick is just like, yeah, fuck, here we go again with these guys. Has everybody seen this clip? It's up on YouTube. John, do you want to come down from there? <laughs> no! Ah. It's like, what a great shot. It's fucking, isn't that fucking brilliant? Uh, I'm playing bass. It's like, what, fuck, what the, we just didn't give a fuck. Oh, I'll play bass then. Which I remember thinking, so Wobble started playing drums and suddenly you hear Wobble playing drums out of time with everything. I remember thinking, like, oh, that, that's my fucking career. If somebody thinks that's me, I can't even play along with the songs on the television. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Oh, that's the dressing room. But that's a great shot of Jeanette. Uh, that's my arm over there. Uh, and I don't know where this, where this shot came from. I still have my sign from the dressing room door. Public. I still have my canceled check from Dick Clark Productions. He came into the dressing room, right? And he was just like, mm -hmm. yeah. Just like, Who's this old guy? Well, we had no idea who he was. He's like, yeah, Dick Clark. And Wobble says, uh, I'm Joe Wobble. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> the day after American Bandstand, we did um, the Olympic Auditorium. Thanks for that shot. And uh, <laughs> it's one of the last days of the tour. I remember going outside, oh, hey Lacey. I remember going outside 
I'm like, okay, yeah, fucking John Lydon, Wobble, Keith Levine. Not playing. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be 10,000 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not fucking playing until you put my name in lights, until you put my name in plastic lettering. It's not simply not going to happen. Yeah, careful what you wish for, Keith, Keith Atkins Levine. Oh, fuck. Uh, I remember the Olympic pretty good. Um, eight to 10,000 people. Um, fucking chaos. Uh, my friend Maggie was there. I met Maggie in San Francisco. I will tell you this story in a bit. Uh, Maggie remembers selling acid at this show. The promoter was from San Francisco and it was humid. And Maggie left early because, and we've all left shows for this reason. I know we have. The acid f f that she was selling was starting to leach into her skin with the humidity. And she was like tripping balls. Yeah, I know, we've all, yeah. A yeah. um, couple of interesting LA bits. Anybody remember Brendan from Club Lingerie and the Mask? Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, I'm still talking to everybody. Um, I had this exchange with him in 2009. Glad to hear you from you. Did you see the article in The Guardian where this chump says pills not pill without Levine and Wobble? And I say, what about the special fucking drumming? Yeah! And then this. Ba, ba, ba. Uh, best of luck, Brendan. P.S. Wait. I talked to Keith about 10 years ago. I just remember the last time I saw him. Hilarious story, I tell you one day. Then he died. Thanks a lot, Brendan. We'll never, we'll never know. <laughs> Righteously fired. And I think I did a Brian Brain tour of the States, did some other stuff, licked my wounds, and then we get to uh, Flowers of Romance. Um, it's wonderful to be talking about this with Nick Lorne in the room. Oh, please hold your applause. Uh, it's number 42 on Kurt Cobain's handwritten list. Um, I don't know if we were number 42. I'm reading from left to right. One, two, it's number three. <laughs> it's number fucking three on Kirka. And if that's not correct, well, okay. You know, my dad bought me my drum kit when I was nine. And he used to come and see me play. He saw me play with, with Killing Joke and Pill. He used to drink with John on occasion, which was kind of cool. John and Nora in the back of the bus with my mom. And my mum used to knit me and John musical note sweaters. <laughs> fucking embarrassing. Fuck. Oh, mum's knitted us a sweater. We were like... um, and it was really important for me. Like my dad supported me and then he kind of didn't. When I didn't take a regular path and I just kept on playing my drums. He didn't support me. He questioned what I was doing until I was on Old Grey Whistle Test and John Peel and, and the front cover of Melody Maker, and then he was kind of proud. And I'm like, yeah, well, fuck you. Now you're proud. But we sorted all of that out. And, um, and when I started to teach, and then I wrote my first book, it was so important. My dad was ill, and it was so important for me that he saw my first book so I could say, Dad, I drums, I wrote a book. And then he turned me on to Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie says you'll make more friends in two months being interested in other people than you'll make in two years trying to get other people interested in you. And I love that. And so I started to speak all over the world. And my dad just kept getting ill. He never saw my third book, but he saw my first two. And one of the things I wanted to do so much was to use my writing skills and my speaking skills to eulogize him at his funeral. And 
they couldn't speak. I couldn't open my mouth. I had to, it took so many muscles and so much energy just to not bawl. The second time I couldn't speak was on the drive back from La Jolla with John in the passenger seat and Maggie in the back. And John has a skill. He's charismatic. And with every step you take towards him, he can measure you up and lift you up. I'm not talking about making your day or making your week. He could raise you up for the rest of your life. This bizarre, charismatic power that he has. Or he could fucking destroy your shit. Seen it. Seen it too many times. So I'm talking to Maggie. I'm like... Yeah, I think on the way back, John started to criticize your performance. And she said, yeah, I was in the back seat. And he really started to lay into me, criticize everything that I did. I'm like, I bet I know what you were thinking. Like, what a, what a fucking asshole. He was. And she's like, no. I was thinking, Martin, Martin, when will you make this stop? When will you say something that will make him stop this? I'm a positive person. And I'm trying to, well, you, you never know with the, like this, I couldn't fucking think of anything. All I could think of was that I should tell that story in the hopes that one of my sons would read it and speak up at some point in their future. There's no repairing that shit. There's just the potential to repair it in the future. And I think um, that was also um, a point where I let go of whatever I had first intended this book to be. And then I did this beat. And then I did this and that. And the New York Times said, ba 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 bo ba ba bo I let go of whatever that book might have been and started to just open it up to be something else. I guess that's my way of saying sorry to Maggie. Um, she never sang again after that. So I look at that entry in the diary, La Jolla, what was it, June? Was it June? Yeah. I think it was June, yeah. Um, within two months of that, I told John I was leaving the band. That was the only fucking unraveled fucking thread that I could find to cling on to. I left the band when it was at its most successful, I think. I just couldn't be around it anymore. <laughs>
it's strange actually. So, um, so I left Pill, and I sent demos out to a bunch of labels, and nobody was listening. So I started my own label and released 350 albums. And because I was doing that, I thought, well, I should have my own studio. So I built my own studio and taught myself to engineer and produce. And um, I bought Steve Albini's tape machines and put the studio together and just made my own way, which I think was a product of all of that time um, around punk. But <clears throat> just to finish up, Remember what I told you at the beginning about all the good stuff? So, so I quit. And, and that was not easy. Um, but I felt pretty good about my decision. I think I was 24. And I I think I thought I would just join another huge international band and carry on touring the world. And I went out to New Jersey. New Brunswick, New Jersey was where my, my girlfriend was living. And I went to the Melody Bar in New Brunswick. And uh, I was trying to make a go of it. And, uh, and this kid came up to me one night. He's like, fuck, my Atkins. This is not a love, yeah, song, right? Miami Vice, yeah, Metal Box, yeah, Flowers of Romance, <laughs> do, 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 yeah. He said, and you quit? You fucking quit the band? I went, yeah, I fucking did. He's like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it dawned on me till then the enormity of what I decided to do. And shortly after that, I got a bunch of parking tickets. And then it turns out my legal stay in America was courtesy of Warner Brothers H1 multiple entry visa, and then Electra Asylum non such, H2 multiple entry work permit. Tick tock, tick tock. So I don't have any money, nothing's going on. I've got these parking tickets. I had these two friends, Jean Bessette, French guy with blue hair, and John O'Brien, American guy. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, come out on our construction crew. Uh, they were getting 20 an hour. I got six, because I wasn't allowed to work. Plus, I didn't know what I was doing. And after a couple of months of that, we were building decks in New Jersey. And the boss comes in. Oh, here we go, Martin. Yeah. Fucking Tico Torres, mate. Tico Torres, drummer from Bon Jovi. Yeah. We're planting trees for Tico. Oh, fuck. <laughs> huh? Yeah. What? Oh, no. <laughs> All right, I'm here with Martin Atkins, of, formerly of PIL and Killing Joke and Ministry and Brian Brain and some of my favorite bands ever. And we've just watched a wonderful display of your past, which you have... Uh, curated us all through. Uh, did you have a good time tonight? Uh, yes. <laughs> it, but it's not, it, so I'm, I'm workshopping this stuff, which I, hopefully it was entertaining, but there's times where you might have seen I just kind of stopped and just dealing with all of this stuff that I've just- The surfaced. emotions, yeah. Yeah, uh, Maggie yeah. is a good friend of mine. We were oh, really? we worked uh, together with Janet Cunningham, who was our agent in film. I, I didn't know that she was such an influence in your life. That's fantastic that you're friends with her. So you are part of the LA punk scene. Yes, yes. Well, we were here for well that Olympic show. 
was part of it. And then we moved out here from 83 to 85. John's still here. Larry White, our manager, saw the loft we had in New York, 19th Street and 11th Avenue, and said, you guys could get a house in the hills with a swimming pool for what you're paying for this fucking dump. <laughs> and we were two kids from England. We're like, yeah. Larry's a good friend of mine as well. I was just saying hi to him. He called on the phone. I know, I was talking I'd to him. I love this shit. He's great, I right? love this shit. Isn't it great? It brings all your friends together, all your memories, all the past seems to be colliding for you, like super collider, yeah? Yeah, but I think it's important for me to say um, I'm not trying to create this. Uh, Martin's drumming was amazing. Then Martin did the... I'm not trying to create that, as you saw with the thing with Maggie. Mm -hmm. Re finding these friends and retelling these stories and hearing the other sides of the stories, sometimes it's really painful. Yes. You know, really painful. But I like it, but it's painful. Well, we met, uh, I think it was May 2nd, 1980, at La Dome. Oh my God. At the first pill press, press conference. Do you remember that? I think you told me that the glass of water, a bottle of Perrier cost like 200 bucks. Uh, well, so back in those days, I, I think I need to say it might have been La Dome, it might have been somewhere else, but you give the waiter a $200 tip and they bring you a gram. Oh, yes, we have. To a your table. Yes, yes. Well, I, I kind of missed that. It could have been another restaurant. I'm not sure. Well, but I was with you at La Dome, and I didn't get a gram. But if I had known, I would have certainly put in some money for that. Yeah. <laughs> the 80s, man. Well, I want you to autograph this book for me. And this is one of Martin's books. How many books do you have out currently? Three. Too smart. Welcome to the music business. You're fucked and bad smart. Fantastic. Well, he's going to sign this book for us. Thank you for watching Tequila TV with Martin Atkins from Pill. Wow. Am I signing the cover? Huh? Inside. Inside. T A Q. What? T E Q. T E Q. Yeah. It's only tequila because Johnny Rotten used to call me tequila. No.